Good afternoon, my name's Sam Butler and I'm from St John Ambulance. We're here today to learn something incredible, how to save a life. I'm joined on the sofa by Adam and Shanai. They're both St John Ambulance first aid trainers and they're going to show us some basic first aid skills. It won't take long and it won't be difficult, but by the end of this afternoon, you'll be able to help a classmate, family member or neighbour in an emergency. You might be thinking right now, this isn't for me, I could never save a life, but trust me, it's so easy to learn. And once you know how, you will have the confidence to be a first aid hero. We're very excited about today. There's over 1,000 schools tuning in, which we're pretty sure makes this the biggest first aid lesson ever. We've got students watching all over the country, and whether you're an experienced first aider or hadn't even heard of first aid until five minutes ago, we want to hear from you. If you've got a question about anything that we're teaching you, please get in touch. If you're on Facebook or Twitter, make sure you use our hashtag BigFirstAidLesson when you tweet. Details about the different ways you can get in touch are on your screen now. We're looking forward to hearing from you. We're going to be teaching you three skills today, and in a minute, Adam and Shanai are going to talk you through the first of these. But before we do that, there's a short clip which shows you just how important first aid can be and how young people like you really can be first aid heroes. When, I, when it first happened, I had like a couple of seconds of, oh my God, what am I doing? But then, um, the, the training that you do actually learn kicks in and you realise what you need to do. And it sort of kind of all just rolls off, off your head. Actions at a time like that mean all the difference between life and death. Um, if the actions hadn't taken place, the man would have died. At the time he had the heart attack, he'd, he'd stop breathing, he'd, life had gone and Sam brought it back to him. When, he, when we realised he stopped breathing, I attempted to do CPR, but I didn't feel I was strong enough because of the size of me, but also because I have a heart condition. Having the knowledge of first aid just feels like something that you should just have there. Obviously, when something like that, that like this does happen, you should be proud, but you should just know how to do it anyway, and, but be proud about having the knowledge. Sam's quite modest about the fact that he was just doing what he'd been taught, but he had the courage to step forward. And a lot of people would actually just pass it by or, and, and, and not bother to get involved. So, yeah, I think Sam's a hero. I think that everybody that does something like that's a hero. It's an amazing story, isn't it? Sam's a real inspiration, and we were so proud when he overcame stiff competition to win an award at our Everyday Heroes event earlier this year. Here he is, looking very sharp, with Tess Daly, who hosted this year's event, and the Countess of Wessex. The award Sam won was named in memory of a young man called Guy Evans, who died a few years ago in an accident. Guy was only 17, and his death is incredibly sad. One of the tragic things about it is that first aid could have saved his life. He was surrounded by his friends at the time, but because none of them knew first aid, none of them could help. If one of your friends needed first aid, would you know what to do? If the answer is no, then listen in. This might be the most important lesson you ever learn. Adam and Sharne are going to talk you through the first of today's scenarios now. Guys, it's over to you. Hello, my name's Adam and I'm a St John Ambulance trainer and this is Sharne, she's a St John cadet trainer. Cadets are one of our youth programmes and we're going to be telling you more a bit about that later. So, here we're going to teach you some real key but really simple life-saving skills. Hi, I'm Sharne and as Adam said, these skills could be the difference between life and death. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask or maybe you've just been in a similar situation or you've been taught differently, we'd like to hear it. So please, get in touch. OK, great. We're going to start with what's called the primary survey. This is the very first thing you do when you're assessing a casualty. 
So on the floor here, we have a casualty. And there's five letters you need to remember. Danger, response, airway, breathing, and circulation. D-R-A-B-C, or we call it Dr. A-B-C. So we're going to start with D, danger. The first thing that we're going to do is have a real good look around, make sure that there's nothing that could harm you or the casualty. Can you see anything? No, no danger. No? You're looking for things like broken glass on the floor, wires, or you could be in the middle of the road, so you've got to be really careful of other cars driving around. OK, then we're going to look at response. So we're going to see if we can get a response from this casualty. Hello, can you hear me? Open your eyes, wake up. So what happens if they can't hear you? That's a good question. What we're going to do is kneel down next to Joe and give him a quick tap on the shoulder, maybe a little shake. Hello, can you hear me? Wake up for me, open your eyes. OK. So can I call the ambulance now? Not yet. We do know something's wrong, but we don't know exactly what yet. So if you're on your own, you need to shout for help because you're on your own. You know something's not quite right. But if you're with somebody, I'm with Sharnae, so just stay there for me. I'm going to need your help in a minute. OK. Now we're going to go on to A, which is the airway. What's an airway? The airway is the nose, the mouth, and the throat. And what could happen when someone goes unconscious is their tongue goes to the back of their throat, and that could stop them from breathing. So what we need to do is open the airway. So we put two fingers underneath the chin, we put our hand on the top of the head, we tilt the head back, and we lift the chin up. That opens the airway. Now what's really important is that you keep these two fingers underneath the chin. OK, next we're going to go on to breathing. Now for breathing, we do three things. We need to look, listen and feel. So I'm going to look down his chest, feel for any breath on my face and listen to see if I can hear him breathing. So how long do you do this for? I do this for up to 10 seconds. OK, great. So that's breathing. Now what I'm going to do is check for circulation. So any bleeding that you can find in the casualty. So I'm going to check all of his arms and all of his body. You said blood. Don't you need to wear gloves? Not just yet, because we don't know exactly if there is any bleeding. What we're doing is do a quick check to see if there is any. If you do find blood, it's really good to get some gloves. But don't worry too much. This is just a quick check to see if there's any bleeding. Can you see any? No, no bleeding. No? That's great. And that's as simple as it is. That's our primary survey. So what we're going to do now is have a quick recap of our primary survey. Thanks, guys. That was great and a really, really important basic skill to get us all started. It all seems pretty simple, but is there anything that could go wrong? Is there anything that people should sort of be aware of? No, just follow these real simple steps. Remember Dr. ABC and nothing can go wrong. And in terms of confidence, people often say that they may not feel confident enough to deliver first aid. Is there, is there anything that you can sort of say to reassure people yeah. around that? By learning first aid, you're going to build your confidence. And the younger you can learn first aid, the better. We know of some situations where young people take charge of emergencies when other adults are panicking. So it's great that we've got this on today where people can learn these life-saving skills. Thanks, Adam. Um, so by the end of the big first aid lesson, we will all be feeling that bit more confident. There are some great questions already starting to come in from schools around the country. And remember, if you want to get involved, the details are on your screen now. We're joined now by the students of Ashington School in the Northeast. Hi, everyone. Can you hear us? Hello. Hi, uh. OK, so could we, could we have a question? Have you, anybody got any questions for either Sharnae or Adam? OK. Hi. OK, so we, we're unable to hear her, unfortunately, but we've got some questions here on, on the wall. Um, OK, use Dr. ABC to remember the primary survey, check for danger response airway breathing. At our, at our school, we only have black box. Um, OK, so we've got some technical issues here, apparently. Um, OK, so I'm going to ask a question on behalf of some of the schools there. Um, in terms of sort of basic things that people may come across, um, scenarios, obviously you said sort of danger is the first thing to be aware of because obviously you don't want two casualties. But in terms of um, something as simple as, say, a nosebleed, have you got any kind of advice for us on that at all, Sharnay, maybe? Have you... OK, the most important thing you need to know about a nosebleed is so many people tilt their head back 
you, the most important thing about a nosebleed is to pinch the nose and tilt the head forwards. Because if you tilt the head back, the blood can go down your throat and that could cause even more damage to just the simple nosebleed. So most importantly is to pinch the nose and lean the patient forwards. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much. So we're going to go back to the hangout again. OK, guys, can you, can you hear us now, guys? Sorry about that earlier. OK, so could we, could we grab that question again from from the, the lady at the front with the, the, the lady with the green post-it note. Brilliant. Sorry, we just couldn't hear you ask it last time. <laughs> um, what do you do if someone is choking? What do we do if someone is choking? Adam, would you okay. like to... It's a really good question. First of all, what you need to do is encourage them to cough and slightly lean them forward to give them some support. If that still doesn't work, then we need to do what's called back blows. So in between their shoulder blades on their back, we need to give them five sharp blows to their back to try and force this object out. Try that a couple of times, and if that still doesn't work, then you need to call 999 for an ambulance. Thank you very much, Adam. OK, so um, thank you so much for your questions, and we'll, we'll get back to you guys all later. Um, if you keep, keep those questions coming in, though, that would be absolutely amazing. Um, Adam and Sharnay will be taking you through the next bit of the lesson in a minute. So, guys, if you'd like to cool. make your way over and get ready for that, thank you very much. Um, before they do that, though, I'd like you all to meet James Pidwell. So, James, welcome. Come in. Hi, yeah, it's very nice yeah. to meet you. Um, James, obviously, you had a situation involving um, your sister, I believe, who I would imagine is very grateful to the fact that you were there. Would you like to just explain a little bit about what uh, Basically, on my 16th birthday, uh, she had a freak epileptic fit in the middle of the road. And obviously this, she was having an epileptic fit on the floor, but during the process of this, she had swallowed her tongue and her hair, which had blocked off her airways. So you, I believe you actually, before this incident happened, you actually knew first aid. Luckily, um, during uh, my time at the Sea Cadets, I'd been trained within first aid, and I knew what to do within the situation. Okay, so would you like to just talk, sort of talk us through the scenario and how you um, came up with your sister? Obviously, as the other guy said, danger was the main thing. Since we were on a road, I had to block off the road with bags, uh, whatever I could get my hands on, basically. Secondly, um, she was causing herself damage from violently shaking on the floor, so I had to sort of cushion her head with a blazer to stop any further damage. Next was her airways. Um, this was the main sort of priority now, because she couldn't breathe. So I had to tip her head back and put her chin up to release her tongue, and I also had to put her hair out as well. Wow, that sounds amazing. How were you actually feeling whilst all that was um, going on? I think adrenaline was the main sort of thing going through my body, just thinking this needs to be done categorically, doing the things that needed to be done uh, within first aid. Uh, emotion sort of just, this is my sister, let's try and yeah. save her. And how did you feel afterwards? Afterwards, after we calmed down in the hospital, I was just, I was just happy to see that she was okay. I it think was great. She was, she was pretty happy as well. I would yeah, think. it was well, good to see her. Well done, and thank you so much for coming on today. No problem. Um, Finally, if you could give any advice to some of the young viewers that are watching us today, what would that be? Um, I think it's essential for everyone to learn first aid. So I'd say. Uh, go to St John's Ambulance, go to your cadets, do first aid courses so you can become skilled within this to help anyone else around you. Brilliant, thank you so much James. Um, it just goes to show what an impact first aid can have. The guys are ready to show you how it's done now but before we go over to them a quick reminder for teachers. Teacher notes for today's lesson are available to download from this site as well as on our dedicated website teachthedifference.org.uk and everyone who's watching, if you have a smartphone and you want to make sure that you've always got first aid at your fingertips, make sure you download our free app after school. If you just search for St John Ambulance in your app store, you'll find the app there and you'll be able to download it. OK, so over to Sinead. OK, now Sinead is going to talk us through the recovery position. OK, before we do the recovery position, we have to go through the primary survey, which is doctors ABC. So first. We start with assessing for danger. So Adam, can we see any danger? No, no danger. That means we can go on to response. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Hello, hello, can you open your eyes? Shall I call for an ambulance? No, not just quite yet. Okay. What we gotta do is open the airway. So two fingers, put back. And how long do you do that for? Uh, up to 10 seconds. Okay. Um, now we can call that ambulance. Cool. And say, can you tell we've got an unconscious patient who is breathing? 
Now we check C for circulation, which is make sure our patient isn't bleeding. Now we can go on to recovery decision. We can let go of our airway because this should be very quick and simple. So why do we do this recovery position? We do the recovery position because it is a safe and stable way of making sure the patient's airway is open and not blocked. Okay, cool. Okay, now the first stage of the recovery position is the arm closest to you, just move out of the way, and then grab the hand furthest away from you, high five, and put it on the cheek. And what does this arm do? This arm will support the head when we roll him over. Okay, cool. Then we grab the leg from the outside, and then this will form a lever where we should be able to easily roll him over, but supporting the head. And most importantly, is to open the airway again, check for breathing, do this with the back of your hand. I can feel that he's still breathing. Then what we do with this leg, is it to brace him and support him. And once again, check for bleeding. Cool. That sounds really simple. Should we see that right from the beginning and go all the way through? Sure. Cool. There's no danger. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Hello, hello, can you open your eyes? Can you call the ambulance and say we've got an unconscious patient who is breathing, please? Sure. And that's how you do the recovery position. And now we're gonna do a recap of all the skills and knowledge you need to know. Thank you guys, and thanks to James as well. It just goes to show how useful these skills can be. I'm joined now on the sofa by Tom Wilkes. Tom's 17 and from Manchester, and like Sharne, he's a cadet with St John Ambulance. So Tom, how long have you been with St John Ambulance? I've been in the organisation for about six years now. And when, when, did, you, when did you actually join? Um, I joined because of a first aid lesson in primary school, like the students today, and I just got hooked on it. Brilliant, okay. Um, do you remember the first time you actually had to use first aid? I do, that was dead simple, just giving someone a plaster at an event. Okay. And have you had to administer sort of seri serious first aid? Have you ever had to do that? Um, unfortunately, yeah. There was an incident last year where a friend and I were involved with a cardiac arrest and we uh, had to try and resuscitate a patient. And can you tell us a little bit more about what actually being a cadet involves? Yeah, so being a cadet uh, involves doing a wide range of things, such as going on events, um, learning skills like media studies, drama, care on duty, things like that, and also going out to communities and just having a smile. And what do you enjoy most about it? Personally, because I'm a peer educator, I enjoy going out training young people. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so a peer educator is someone who has a BTEC qualification, and they go out to schools and youth groups and teach young people from the ages of 6 to 18 in uh, basic first aid skills which hopefully can save a life. And what else would you say that you've got out of being a peer educator? Um, actually watching the young people develop when I'm training them and knowing myself that they've got a, young, they've got a skill that can save a life. And if anybody out there watching today would like to become either a cadet or a badger, is there anything you can, you can advise them on on how they can do that? Yep, so I'll talk about badgers. Badgers is our young youth programme, and that's for young children aged 5 to 10, and they can go outside, they do like outdoors activities, they do explorer badges, first aid as well as our main core activity. And then you've got cadets, which is from 10 to 17. Uh, they do public events like uh, football concerts, One Direction concert in Manchester last weekend. Um, and as well... Like I said before, there's other reasons for like peer education. Brilliant. It sounds so interesting. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's a good, a good idea to get uh, Sharnay and Adam back into the studio. Hi, guys. Okay, so we've got some more questions here on the wall. Okay, 
So, Shane, could you answer this one? How can you recognise if someone is having a heart attack? If someone's having a heart attack, how you'll recognise it is they're going to be very short of breath. They're probably holding onto their chest and they'll probably be sweating because they're trying to gasp for breath. Just the best way is just to help them down and call an ambulance. Okay, thank you very much. OK, um, we've, we've talked about the, the choking one. Um, OK, so that's quite an interesting one there. Adam, do you do CPR for unconsciousness or DRABC? So you would do CPR when you find out that somebody's not breathing. So we talk about the recovery position, which is something that you use if they are breathing, but they're unconscious. If you get to the B part, uh, the breathing, and you find out that they're not breathing, you then start CPR. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much. Um, OK, we've got another one here saying, if the airway is, airway is blocked, what do you do? Is it the same as if someone's choking? Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, OK, there's another one here. Have any of you saved somebody's life? It says, how old were you when you saved someone's life for the first time? I was probably about 12. I helped someone who had severe heat stroke and was coming in and out of consciousness. That was my first time I had a major incident. Wow. Anyone else got any stories? I don't think it really matters if uh, someone saves a life. It's, even if you just give someone a bandage or a plaster, you're making a difference to that person, and that's what counts. Brilliant, thank you. And you never know how much a situation could escalate to the point where you've done something to prevent it from becoming a situation where somebody's life is at risk as well, I guess. Um, OK, so um, Sharne and Adam are about to take you through the last bit of training. So, guys, if you want to make your way over. Um, in the meantime, please keep those questions coming in. Tom's going to be sticking around for a bit as well. So if you've got any questions for him about St John Ambulance cadets or badgers and how you can get involved, please get in touch now. After the next session, we're going to round things off with a short quiz, recapping everything that you've learned today. Sharne and Adam, it's over to you. OK, so now Adam's going to teach us how to treat a major bleed. OK, what we're going to do is start with the primary survey, which we've just done. So we're still going to do Dr. ABC, danger, response, airway, breathing and circulation. So first of all, we need to check for any dangers. Now, the fact that he's bleeding could mean that there's something sharp around. So I'm going to have a good look around to make sure that there's any dangers. Can you see any? Um, not really, no? no. All good. OK, the next thing I'm going to do is check for a response. So I'm going to talk to him. Hello, my name's Adam. I'm a first aider. What's your name? My name's Joe. OK, so Joe spoke to me, so I know that he's responding and I know that his airway is open and he's breathing, so that's really good. So we don't need to worry about that. But what we do need to worry about is this nasty cut. Now, don't be too frightened. It may look really nasty, but we're going to teach you some really simple steps to go through how you can help Joe out. So first of all, we need to remember three words, three key words, pressure, elevate and position. The first thing we need to think about is pressure. Now, if you've got a bath full of water and you've got a load of water coming out of the bath, to stop that water coming out, you put a plug in it. And that's exactly what we need to do here, is to put a plug in it to stop the blood coming out. So, Joe, can you just put some pressure with that hand over the top? Fantastic. Secondly, we're going to do some elevation. Now, I want you to do this right now in school, to put one hand up in the air and put one hand down. Now, in a minute, not yet, we're going to put those arms together. What's going to happen? If you've got lighter skin, look at the back of your hand. If you've got darker skin, look at the palms of your hands. OK? OK? And put them together. And you'll see that one hand is lighter than the other. Now, that's because the blood flow has gone down. So that's exactly what we need to do here. So, Joe, just pop your arm in the air for me. And we're going to try and slow that bleeding down. OK, fantastic. And then the third key thing that we need to remember is position. It's not great that Joe's standing up because he's lost a lot of blood and he may start to feel a bit faint. So we're going to sit him down on the floor and we're going to give him some help. So, Shane, can I have your help just to sit Joe on the floor nice and easy? Fantastic. OK, great. How are you feeling? I'm all right now, thank you. OK, good. So now we're going to put a bandage on this and stop this bleeding. So, Shane, can you go and get me a bandage, some gloves, and call an ambulance, please? OK. That's great. OK. So while Shane has gone to get that, what's really important is that we keep on talking to Joe, make sure that he's OK, give him some reassurance. So don't worry. Shane is right here. Fantastic. OK. So first thing I'm going to do is pop some gloves on. So what would you do if you don't have any gloves? 
If you don't have any gloves, what we need to remember is that if you've got any cuts or grazes on your, on your hands that they're covered up. Um, what's really important is that we're trying to prevent any infection or any germs getting into this. But don't worry too much. Just try and make sure that it's as clean as possible. Okay. So pop those on. Then have you got that bandage there? Yep. Fantastic. Okay. So I'm going to open this bandage. So what would you do if you don't have a bandage? If you don't have a bandage, what you can do is use a bit of clothing, a bit of cloth, something that's going to stop that bleeding. Okay? So what I'm going to do is open the bandage, and you've got this pad here. Now, it's really important you don't touch the pad, because that's the bit that's going to touch this wound. Okay, I'm just going to ask Joe to open there, and I'm going to pop this on there. Joe, can you hold that for me? Fantastic. And all I'm going to do is wind the bandage around the pad, from top all the way down to the bottom. How's that feeling? It's a lot better, yeah. That's good. OK, good. So what would you do if it bled through the first bandage? If it bled through here, then you would put another one on top of that. OK. And what happens if it bleeds through the second one? If it bleeds through the second one, you would take them both off, because there's a lot of blood coming out, and you want to make sure that there's enough pressure on. So take them both off and start again. OK. OK. So now we've tied it round. What I'm going to do is tie it in a knot. And what would you do if there's a big piece of glass sticking out? Ooh, that's a good question. So if something was sticking out of it, what you would do is put pressure on it either side of the wound. So say there was a piece of glass sticking out, you put pressure on either side. What's really important to remember is that you don't take the glass out because that's stopping any bleeding. OK. OK. So what we're going to do now, Joe, just pop that over there and just support your elbow. That's great. So what we're going to do is lie Joe down now because he's lost a lot of blood. We want to make sure that he's OK. So just lie down nice and slowly for me. Fantastic. OK. And Shanae, can you raise his legs up? That'd be great. And what would you do if I wasn't here to raise his legs up? If you weren't here, don't worry about that. What's really important is that you're protecting the patient. You're making sure that this bleeding is controlled. OK. So when you've got the legs up, that's really allowing the blood flow to go to the heart and the brain, the real important organs in the body to make sure those are still working OK. OK. How are you feeling? I feel a lot better. That's fantastic. OK. Great. So what we're going to do now is have a quick recap of those really simple skills that we've just learned on how to treat major bleeding. Thanks very much, guys. OK, so we're going to go back to Ashington School now, who have another question for us. Hello, do you feel that you've learned some important stuff today, guys? Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Do you, have, do you have any more questions for us at all? Uh, we've got a question from Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Hi. What is the minimum first aid, aid knowledge that someone should know? OK, so should we each, each take a... a chance to answer that, Adam? Uh, we've gone through the kind of primary survey and I think that's really important. It's the five key things because until you've done that, you don't really know what's happened. So uh, one for me would definitely be the primary survey. Shani? Same. It's just primary survey. You want your patient to be able to breathe, so make sure you just get that airway open as long as you know that that's just halfway to saving someone's life. And Tom? Again, I'd agree the primary yeah. survey is the basic thing with first aid. Okay. And in terms of that first aspect of the, of the primary survey, danger, um, could you give us an example of kind of moments where you've come across danger around a patient and had to deal with that first? Um, mainly for me, the main like, danger has been uh, bystanders, strangely. Um, some of them can get quite in your face, want to know what's going on. So if you can try to control the situation, you're sorted. And what sort of things have you done in order? Do you sort of often get one of them to kind of help control the crowd? And You can do. Or another way to involve them is to ask them to face the other way. And right. um, that helps them get involved. They feel, you know, part Very of important. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Shane? In terms of danger around a patient that you've had to treat, can you give us an example of things that you should be looking for? Danger is just simply, especially accidents that happen on the street, it's just bits of glass or like simply bottles or cans which anyone can trip over, just simply traffic. So if you have, if you're on the street, there's going to be bystanders. So to help them feel like they're involved, just get them to stop cars coming to and from. And as Tom said, they could be quite in your face. So if you, can, if you have a mate or somebody, just try and calm them down, especially if there's like a worrying mother next to them. You need to 
reassure them before the patient because some of them could be quite close because they want to know everything because that's like their child. So just make sure you can control control. You kind of want to use your bystanders as well because they can help clear the danger while you're helping them. So just be like, oh, there's some cans here. Can you just clear it out the way? You just, you just want to involve them because it can make everything run even smoother. Brilliant. Thank you. And Adam. Okay, yeah. So if you're in the middle of the road, you've got to be careful of the traffic. And we spoke about things that you can see, but you also might need to have a bit of a smell because it could be a gas leak and that could be the reason why somebody's lying on the floor. Right. So as well, what you can see, what you might be able to smell or um, things like that, really important. Brilliant. Thank you. And obviously, sometimes objects on the patient themselves can be dangerous, I guess. Like if you've got sort of keys in their pocket or glasses. So always sort of be checking for those kind of things as well. Yeah, that's right. So if you, before you turn anybody in the recovery position, it's always good to check their, their pockets. Um, if they've got any glasses on, remove them, because you don't want those getting broken or causing the casualty even more kind of harm, really. Brilliant. Thank you, Adam. Andrew, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Is there, are there any more questions at all from anybody? Could, could I ask a question, please? What do you do if um, somebody's cut a major vein, okay. major artery? Who'd like to answer that? OK. Um, so a, a major artery is very similar to what we've just done in terms of a major bleed. So you just need to really try and apply lots of pressure. It's not going to be easy because the pressure of those major arteries is really strong. But what's really important, again, use that bath analogy. If you've got loads of water coming out of a bath, you need to try and put a plug in it, and it's exactly the same. Just try and put a lot of pressure on. You might not even get to the bandage stage of that. You might just have to put physical pressure on to try and stop that bleeding. Did that help, Did that help answer your question? Yes, Brilliant. thank you. Are there any more questions at all from anyone at the school? OK, well, thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll, we'll see you soon. Take care. OK, so thank you so much for taking part today. Um, it's now your turn to answer the questions. We've come up with a quick multiple-choice quiz to check that you've all been paying attention. All the questions are true or false, so put your thumbs up if you think it's true, and put your thumbs down if you think it's false. OK, so the, the question that we're going to start with is, the first thing you should do when you come across an incident is check if the casualty is breathing. Is that true or is that false? OK, guys, what do we think? Is it? And it's false. OK, so, Shana, would you like to just tell us a little bit about why that's false? It's basically the primary survey again. On top of the primary survey is D and it's danger. You want to check for danger because of we don't want to end up with two patients. You're the first aider. We don't want to injure the first aider. So the best thing to do is check for danger and then just continue with the steps from there. Just don't skip any. Just make sure you start with danger and make your way through. Brilliant. Yeah, you're the one who's going to save someone's life, so make sure you're not going to need saving as well. OK, so question number two. If you have a nosebleed, you should tip your head back to stop the blood. Is that true or is that false? OK, guys, what are we saying, is it? And it's false. I think we've talked about this a bit earlier. So, Adam, would you like to tell us why that's false? Yeah, sure. So, um, with a nosebleed, it's really important that you keep the head forward. What you don't want to do is tilt the head back because that blood's going to go back down their throat and it could cause some choking. So, pinch the soft bit of the nose and lean them forward. And I've heard in the past that you should put something cold on the back of their neck. Is that, is that true or is that false? That, that may help, but generally it's the pressure okay. on the wound and kind of keeping, it, keeping the head forward. Brilliant, thank you. OK, so question number three. If someone has swallowed something poisonous, you should try to make them be sick. OK, so is that true or is that false? So, guys, is that true or is that... So it's another false. I think there's a bit of a pattern emerging here. Sharna, do you want to tell us why that's false? The reason why it's false is swallowing poison is harmful within itself. Trying to bring it back up, it can burn um, the innards from the throat, trying to bring it up, so it causes more harm. But if they naturally vomit anyway, please try and collect some of that and give it to the ambulance crew, yeah. as nasty as it sounds, but it's really helpful because of from there, the, they can run some tests and see what they actually swallowed to help them instead of like 
pump in their stomach. So it's just really quicker and simpler. Brilliant. Okay, so it may sound nasty, but actually it's really, really Very important helpful. and it can speed up the process of making sure the patient fully recovers. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, so question number four. You can use butter to cool down a burn. Is that true or is that false? What do we all think? Is that so, yeah, it sounded like a bit of an old wives' tale to me. Adam, what should you actually... Yeah, it definitely is. Don't put butter on a burn. Uh, the best thing to do is put it under cold running water for at least 10 minutes to really cool it down. Brilliant. Thank you very much. OK, so our last question today. If someone is choking, you should put your fingers down their throat to try to remove the obstruction. Is that true or is that false? I think we kind of, we, we understood the pattern that was emerging here, but Shana, would you like to explain why that's false? By putting your fingers down someone else's throat, they could actually push the object further down. So what we advise you to do is get them to cough, and if that doesn't nudge it, basically give them five black back blows. So just really firm and really hard in between the shoulder blades, just hit them five times, and that should hopefully just lodge the object. If they're still choking, call the ambulance as quick as possible, but just keep on with the back blows because you never know what could happen. Brilliant, thank you ever so much. So how did you all do? Um, I know that we included a few questions that we haven't covered in today's training, but we may have answered them through some of the questions that were coming in through the schools. Um, so sorry if you found it a bit tricky, but don't worry because this is just a taster. There are loads of ways that you can learn more about first aid. You could sign up to be a cadet or a badger like Tom and Shane or you could get regular bite-sized first aid advice by liking us on Facebook or following us on Twitter. If you have a smartphone, like I've said already, you could download our free app and make sure that you always have access to first aid advice. Or, and this is definitely the best option, you could ask your teacher to arrange more first aid training. Teachers, you'll find everything that you need to give your students the best possible first aid education on our dedicated school's website. That's teachthedifference.org.uk. So, that's just about everything. This lesson will be available to watch again on our website, say sja.org.uk, that's sja.org.uk, along with teacher's notes and information about how to book training in your school. There's also a certificate you can print out by taking part. Thank you to our trainers and to everyone who's watched, especially everyone who's got in touch with questions. We hope that you've enjoyed your first taste of first aid, and we hope it's only the beginning of your life-saving journey. Goodbye, and thanks ever so much for watching. Bye. Bye.